know if I should read anything into the lineup for today, Brendan. Um, second to last. Uh, penultimate. Penultimate, OK. I taught my son in sports. Second last is penultimate. OK, all right. Um, and and I, I, I suppose the other thing is that Urbana needed to check a asset heavy um, a box when, when it when it planned its investments, so that's what we are. And you don't get any heavier. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So. Hello. Good. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, b back in the early noughties, um, the governments, provincial and federal governments, announced a renewable fuel standard. Um, that um, um, all gasoline was going to have to contain 5% ethanol. Um, concurrent with that, they um, uh, announced programs that would provide funding support to businesses um, to build out the capacity in Canada and able to produce that ethanol locally. Um, a bunch of agribusiness people in southern Ontario got together um, with the idea to set up an ethanol business. Um, and um, they did that. Um, they um, started applying for um, this government funding. They were successful in getting that in the form of capital and operating grants. And as well, they raised capital to build this um, plant. Um, initially, equity of $55, $53 million and debt um, through a syndicate of banks of $64 million. The plant was built and started operations on October 1, 2008. In those first five or six years, the plant went through an optimization phase, increased from 40 to 45 million gallons. We also commenced shareholder um, distributions at that time, and the original debt um, that we incurred in building the plant was repaid by the end of 2012. Moving on from 2014, um, the plant recognized that the grants it was enjoying, the operating grants were going to sunset around 2016, and it made, needed to make sure that the business was configured to be profitable post-grant. So we went through a, a series of investments. It was 25 to $30 million, plant optimization capital investments, cogeneration, secondary milling. We invested in the plant to uh, be able to um, produce new product lines, high protein distillers and corn oil, and as well to increase the throughput of the plant, which we were able to do. Um, we increased the plant output from 45 to 50 million gallons. As well, during that time period, we strengthened the balance sheet. And at the end of that period, um, the business had $50 million of cash. We, um, we, we then looked at a number of opportunities. Um, were we going to return this cash to shareholders or were we going to keep it in the business and try and generate a return for shareholders? Um, after looking at a number of opportunities, um, we decided that the, the most efficient use of that cash was to double the size of the plant. Ontario was at a deficit in ethanol at that, that period. Um, as well, there were a number of capital efficiencies that we can enjoy by expanding an existing footprint. Um, the original plant was certain parts of that plant were built that could actually produce 100 million gallons. So we were able to um, double the size of the plant and not have to double the capital that was originally invested. The other thing that uh, the other benefit by expanding an existing footprint was um, since the the overhead and, and much of the staff was there. We had about 65 people at that time. We only had to add 17 people to double the capacity of the plant. So there, there were a lot of efficiencies that, that came through. Um, we decided to do that. Um, uh, the plant uh, was, uh, the expansion was financed uh, with that internally generated cash, um, plus two crown lenders, Farm Credit and Business Development Bank of Canada, supported the debt to build out the, that plant. Um, we did that. Um, it was ready to go in 2018. Um, around that time, um, um, Kevin Norton and myself were appointed CEOs. Um, we had some really rough times in the first two years. The first thing that happened to us, there was a, a, a crop issue in southern Ontario that se severely depressed the price we got for our distiller's grains, one of our co-products, and industry crush margins were um, negatively impacted by some events that were happening in the U.S. Um, we weathered that first year. Second year, we had the pandemic, um, another impact to fuel consumption. Um, we weathered that. 
turned around the business in the third year and um, in the last year we had the best year the business has ever had. Um, where we are now, we have a very strong, we, we've strengthened our balance sheet, we have a very strong balance sheet. We've resumed dividends to our shareholders currently yielding about three and a half percent and we're working actively on a pipeline of projects that are going to reduce the carbon intensity of the plant. So, um, how do we make money? Well, we buy corn. Um, corn is grown within 200 kilometers of the plant. It's priced in U.S. dollars. That corn that comes into the plant in three equal portions gets, uh, gets uh, turned into ethanol um, that we sell to um, blenders mainly in the GTA. It's priced in U.S. dollars. Another third becomes distiller's grains. After the production process um, and the carbohydrates have used to produce the ethanol, we have a, a high protein um, feed product that's sold um, to beef, dairy, swine uh, producers in southern Ontario. And then thirdly, we have carbon dioxide. This is not bad carbon dioxide. It's not the carbon dioxide that comes from um, 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 burning hydrocarbons. Um, this is the carbon that the corn plants sequester during their growth phase. It gets released during our fermentation process. 40% of that is being captured. Um, at the time of the expansion, Air Liquide co-located a capture plant. Um, they are taking 40% of our carbon dioxide. Um, they are um, um, uh, liquefying it, pressurizing it, purifying it, and it's being sold to um, um, greenhouses and carbonated soft drink producers. So IGPC today, um, um, there's a typo there, we're not in the middle of Lake Erie, we're actually in Elgin County, a bit further north of there. Um, we're um, strategically located in southwestern Ontario, close to feedstock supply, as I mentioned, um, and the gasoline distributors. One advantage that we have is, is all of our ethanol moves to Toronto by truck, very rateable, the customers can rely on it. Um, our competition um, um, is in the Midwest and that ethanol has to move via unit trains into the GTA and it's less predictable than ours is. Um, in 2022, we will have $428 million of revenue. We uh, buy 850,000 tons of corn, produce 100 million gallons of low carbon um, biofuel. Um, after the production process, we sell 320,000 tons of distiller's grains, 11,000 tons of corn oil. One of the cuts that we take off of our process is sold to renewable diesel producers in the Gulf. And we have about 84 dedicated employees. So um, this plant, 100 million gallons, um, what it results in is 320,000 tons of carbon reduced annually. And there's an equivalent here, um, carbon dioxide emissions from 90,000 passenger vehicles driven for one year, or the carbon dioxide emissions from um, 1 million miles driven by a passenger vehicle. So you might ask yourself, what, what future could a business have that relies on the internal combustion? Well, go governments, um, um, have made commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, one of the um, biggest sources of greenhouse uh, gas emissions are transportation fuels. So what they have announced at both the provincial and federal level is in Ontario in 2020, they announced that the mandate that was originally 5% is going to go to 10%. That's where we currently are in Ontario. 10% of our gas or 10% of our gasoline is ethanol. Um, they um, have also announced is that ethanol that's blended has a 45% reduction in carbon intensity versus gasoline. Um, our business is all about carbon intensity and that would re result in a carbon intensity score of 46. Our plant has a carbon intensity rating of 42. Um, this increased ethanol demand has increased, um, this demand has increased uh, demand in ethanol here in Ontario from 350 to 400 million gallons. There was another announcement by the provincial government in 2020 that that renewable content will increase further um, starting in 2025 um, and it will increase to 15% in 2030. Uh, an example of how um, the various levels of government are, are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, at the federal level, the, um, 
uh, Ministry of the Environment announced the clean fuel regulations. The oil and gas sector is Canada's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as I said, in 2020, it produced 20% of national emissions. The clean fuel regulations will require that liquid fossil fuel, gasoline and diesel suppliers to gradually reduce the carbon intensity or the amount of pollution from the fuels they produce for use in Canada. And that's going to have to increase by 15% as we move, as we get to 2030. The government, and the government's prediction this is, estimates that about 200 million gallons of additional ethanol will be required in 2030 to meet these, to meet these goals. And more specifically, the clean fuel regulations will increase demand for, for low carbon intensity fuels. The way this is going to work is that the clean fuel regulation will create a, a, a credit market. The regulated parties, the producers and importers of gasoline and diesel, like the SOs and shells that we see, are going to have to buy credits to comply with these requirements. This will create an opportunity for our business because biofuel producers will produce the credits that they will need to comply with the regulations. So this will be another revenue stream for us. So um, IGPC strengths, asset heavy. <laughs> we, are, we are a large industrial asset base located in southwestern Ontario. $350 million has been invested in that site um, over the past 14 years. It's a major driver of economic development in southwestern Ontario. We um, consume about 11% of the corn grown here in Ontario, um, um, more so if you look at just the southwestern Ontario um, area. We have a proven track record. We have a seasoned management team with a track record of managing risk and deploying capital, um, as I've talked about. We're a low-cost operator. The optimi optimizations that we've done the expansion that we've done make, it, make us one of the low cost, lowest cost producers of ethanol in Canada. And we have strategic capital behind us. Our investors, majority being agribusiness people, have a vested interest in our business being successful because of the corn that we buy from them. And the fact that that corn is being bought from them helps their land values as well. And our lenders, Farm Credit and BDC, have been very supportive of us. Um, yeah. I won't talk about the big banks down here who haven't been as supportive as, uh, as those two organizations. So um, our investment hypothesis, we have a very strong balance sheet. Our net debt to 2022 EBITDA is 0.2 to 1. That's not a typo. Uh, we have committed Crown Bank support for our business. Ethanol will be the main pathway to comply under the clean fuel regulations thus creating a significant source of revenue, a new revenue stream for our business by selling credits to the fuel producers. And finally, we have a pipeline of projects targeting the green economy. Um, the biogenic CO2 that I talked about earlier, um, we also, um, there is combustion CO2 produced by our plant. We are actively investigating the feasibility of building a, a um, CO2 capture plant that we would then connect to a pipeline and sequester that CO2. Uh, we uh, believe that there are um, eligible reservoirs not far from the plant. Um, and what, what that does, if you think about it, um, that score that I gave you earlier of 42 carbon intensity, um, the, 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 much of the carbon intensity is, is driven by um, the um, the combustion CO2, the natural gas that, w that we burn in the process. Um, by um, sequestering our carbon, that will drive down our carbon intensity score um, potentially to negative. Um, and if you think about that, the extension of that is, is any car that burns our ethanol um, will be a zero emission vehicle. So um, there, there's, there's a pretty bright future there. Now, we, we don't expect that we're going to see or see 100% ethanol being burnt, but what it means is that the um, the regulated or the obligated parties um, are going to have an incentive to buy our ethanol the lower the carbon intensity score is and pay more for that ethanol. Uh, we are working on a project again um, to green the plant, the green economy, an anaerobic digestion project. There is an organic stream within our within our business that we 
um, that we would take to an anaerobic digester. It's um, heavily laden with organic matter and we would be able to produce natu renewable natural gas, inject it into a pipeline um, and be able to monetize that as a renewable natural gas. And then finally, our plant is um, essentially a sugar producer and the significance of that is um, that sugar now is being turned into ethanol what we can do with that sugar is, is to, there are technologies that will take that sugar and um, be able to produce green chemicals and products that will have a very low carbon footprint. So um, we think that IGPC has a, has, a, has a very bright future. We have a strong balance sheet, strong cash flow generation, committed investors. There are government regulations in place that are going to require increasing amounts of, 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 of biofuels, low carbon fuels in the, in the future. And we have a pipeline of projects that are going to enable us to further press our advantage that we currently have. So that's it. I see a little less than 14 minutes. Questions? Hi, sorry. I needed the mic again after being on stage. Um, the, all very interesting. I'm just curious how you think about um, electric vehicles, electrification of the grid, um, and potential impact on, on the business. Yeah, I knew that question was coming. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, the, the, the government's, I don't think the regulations yet, but they've clearly announced their intention that by 2035 that 100% of all cars sold will have to be electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles. What we also know is that by 2045 or later, that still 50% of all cars on the road are going to be internal combustion engines. The role for our business is, is um, yeah, we, we, we know that that's going to happen, but there's a role for our business to um, continue reducing the carbon intensity of that internal combustion engine um, as we move forward for the next 20, 30, and, and so on years. Well, I got the mic, John. Okay. Did somebody get the mic over for my friend here? Oh, you got one, Michael? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I'm just wondering, um, in regards to the present situation in Ukraine and the green, and I'm not sure in the U.S. as well, for, for the diversion of, of all this corn, plant to be used for ethanol rather than to feed humans. Mm -hmm. Do you see any problem uh, with that in the future? Uh, no, 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 we don't. Um, that's the food versus fuel argument. You know, what, what we've seen is um, the, um, with the producers of corn is that yield of corn increases every year through, through genetics, um, through their, their practices, by about 2.5% per year. And, and we, we have seen this happening for the, for the past 30 years, and, and that will continue to happen. So what, what we're seeing is that um, Attica corn is being grown on ground, perhaps even less ground as we go forward, due to the increase in yield of, 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 the, of the corn that we're getting off the fields these days. I'm not sure that's happening. I mean, we'd have to get that that corn to. I mean, in North America, all of the food producers get have enough corn that they need to produce produce the products. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't I don't agree with that. Uh, yes, if I may, I'd like to make a statement of uh, the electric cars and the pipe dream the government Liverpool has. Any city like Toronto or Vancouver, where a majority of 60% of people live in apartments, and to get those chargers in those apartments almost impossible, would cost a small fortune, and also to get the electricity needed from the new hydro plants, we haven't even got the capacity today. So I just like to say, anybody that believes electric cars are going to get by. 2035, and people can't buy gas cars anymore. That would be the biggest pipe dream in the world because, first of all, they're too expensive, and most people got no places to charge them. Okay, if you live in Rosedale or you live in Bridal Path, fine. 
but not everybody lives up there. Majority of people live in apartments and condominiums, and none of them have charging stations. I, so, I, I, I agree with you, sir. Okay. Um, it, 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 they, they do have challenging goals, and we've gone back and looked at um, all of their targets that, that they have had to try and um, comply with the various cops that have been out there, and they often fail about that. And, and I think they're going to be challenged with that. And that's why I think there's going to be a future for, for our business. But we, we, we just can't sit back on the carbon intensity that we have. We, we, we have to reduce the carbon intensity of our fuel so that the governments can look to our fuel to meet their targets in, in the future. I'll defer to you, sir. Well, I don't have a question, just a comment. Uh, several years ago, I was at a uh, convention of motorcycle enthusiasts in Sturgis, South Dakota. And, uh, <laughs> but I remember going out there and I was stunned. And I, I, you probably know better than I, but I, I clocked about 350 miles of corn as far as I could see in either side of the road. I never, it just unending, just un 350 miles as far as you could see in either direction, they're not, nothing but corn. So uh, massive. So we, we, there's still this great supply down there for whatever purposes they're going to use. But our corn basically is, is Southern Ontario supplied, I gather. Is and, and, and there's plenty of supply. We, we do not have to import corn. And in fact, we are exporting corn from Southern Ontario right. to, to, to Europe. Terrific. Thank you. Brendan, did you want to go before me? Never. All right. Um, I don't know very much about ethanol, but I just have a question from a consumer point of view. As we're, as the government is mandating that increasing percentages of, of ethanol be added to gasoline, how does that impact the final price to the consumer? I mean, is ethanol increasing the price, decreasing the price? I don't quite understand how it works together at the pumps. Um. We, we have seen, and, and I, I, I don't have a graph to show ethanol versus gasoline, but, but right now we are, we are selling, well, well, ethanol is priced on, on plats at about 240, 250 per gallon. Um, you know that people are paying in the U.S. 350, $4 a gallon for, for their gasoline. And, and that has often been where ethanol is positioned versus gas, gasoline. So, um, Ethanol um, is able to reduce the cost um, of, of gasoline. Whether big oil is, is giving it up, um, you know, it, that you know that 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 that's for them to, to, to let us know about that. But but it is it is it is cheaper than the hydrocarbon gasoline. And, and I'll say this. Okay, I have a microphone. And so and so, second question is, how does it affect car performance? It, it um, well, well, it affects car performance in, in, in two ways. One, one is positive and one is negative. I'm not an engineer, but, but at a high level, um, what the industry has evolved to is that they need um, ethanol because it does have a higher octane than hydrocarbon gasoline, that they need ethanol to increase the octane in, in, in the fuel. Um, and that's why there is um, about 14 billion, gallon, 14 billion gallons of ethanol um, blended with gasoline in the U.S. of about 130, 140 million uh, billion gallons that's that's sold, um, is that um, even without a mandate, the big oil companies would still need ethanol because they need it to boost the the um, the octane level of the gasoline. The in terms of the energy value, ethanol is less than 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 hydrocarbon gasoline. Uh, question about price. Yeah. You have input price, you have output price. Do you hedge either risk? And how do the price changes from this year with the corn market affect your bottom line? Yeah, um, we, we, we have done hedging, but um, we, we find um, that it, you're probably better off um, participating or staying in the spot market rather than, than hedging forward. Um, the spot market will always give you a better margin than if you try and anticipate what that margin is going to be in the future and, and hedging your ethanol and, 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 and corn that way. Um, corn is highly, um, is um, corn and ethanol highly correlated? Um, not perfectly. Um, so the way, the fact that um, um, corn has run up to almost $7 a bushel, ethanol has also increased. 
and it depends on the supply-demand balance what that margin is going to look like after the two of those have moved. At the moment, there's actually very good margins in the industry, and, and, there, and there were last year. But there are times when that margin can get pretty tight if that, if that supply or that, that, that supply demand gets out of whack in, in, in the U.S. Two comments and a quick question. Uh, first comment is, as I understand the point you were making, the fact that IGPC supports farmers in the farm industry and actually bolsters at least the local price for corn, that actually encourages the development of more efficient farming and yields continue to go up because of the technolog technological advances. And for those that are interested in that, they should really stick around for the Vive presentation that's coming next because that's the, it's the other piece of this is why we've put you back to back. Mm -hmm. The other reason that I thought it was important to include you, we thought it was important to include you, is that you're actually, of all of our private investments, the only one that's actually really accessible to individual investors through the share transfer platform that Caldwell Securities administers, yeah. so that new people who are interested, because IGPC is a cooperative, but you don't actually have to be a corn farmer to be a member of IGPC and own shares. So I'll put that out that's there. A, that's the second part of the sales pitch, um, right? <laughs> the, the, the only other, so you would have seen uh, that Urbana put out a news release saying that we've just increased our uh, our, uh, our interest in IGPC at I believe four dollars and twenty five cents for every equity share, eleven million shares roughly outstanding, valuing the whole enterprise at forty five million dollars. What was your cash flow in the last uh, twelve months, Ashton? Give or take. It was a lot more than that. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, so we're, we, we we bought into it at uh, a fraction of your cash flow. Curious. Yeah, you did. Yeah. That, that's that's all I pointed one thing. Yeah. Well, well made. I... <laughs> and to, to that point, I did have a little question on the on the banks because, given your balance sheet, given that it looks ESG friendly, what reasoning are the banks giving you for for not lending and the support of the Crown Corps. I'm just a little surprised. Well, um, we, 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 we did talk to the, the, the commercial banks at the time of our expansion. Um, it, unfortunately, we, 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 were, we were evolving at that time. And, and if you looked at our EBITDA at that time, it, it was only, it might have supported maybe $20 million of debt, right? And um, then they said, well, we're not going to do project financing either, right? So, um, Actually, the crown banks, crown banks love to hear that, right? Because then, then they, then they step in because that's their rule, right? When these guys here say we're not going to touch you, then they step in, and and they did, and they provided financing from day one of the expansion. Um, through all the tough times, we got, you know, all of the waivers and amendments we needed to the debt agreements, um, and now they're they're enjoying the benefits of that, where we're we're, we're prepaying the debt and um, covenants are well on side at the moment.